Hey everyone, welcome to episode 101 of Lionheart Radio with your host, Rick Alexander. Today I'm speaking with Teal Stetson Lee. She's a pro mountain biker and she's actually one of the first pro athletes to be sponsored by a marijuana company. And Teal piqued my interest. I read an article about her and about the pervasiveness in marijuana in sport and whether it should be allowed or not. And of course, that's a hot topic now as we're kind of on the brink of ending prohibition in the United States. Of course, not federally, but legally in quite a few states and quite a few others are poised to do so very soon. And so I think it's something that's rapidly approaching. It is an issue within fitness that I think is going to only become more and more prevalent as we go on. And I think we're better off figuring out how we feel about these things before the narrative in the conversation is dictated by opinions that we don't agree with. I think it's important to figure out how we feel about a certain thing, and then we're able to weigh in at least knowledgeably. And so Teal has a really cool point of view on marijuana use and on whether or not it is beneficial. I actually happen to agree quite a bit with her viewpoint on marijuana use, and I think that will become evident as the podcast goes on. As a quick disclaimer, Teal was getting her oil changed in her car, and so we're doing this interview from an oil changing service office, I guess. Uh, And so there are a few interruptions and I actually am just going to skip the very beginning part where we had to have her move into a different room to make it a little bit quieter. I'm going to skip all of that and we'll go right into the conversation with Teal Stetson Lee on Lionheart Radio. Teal is getting her oil changed and has decided to squeeze us into the middle, in which for we are grateful. <laughs> so thanks for that. <laughs> I appreciate you accommodating me. Anytime. So before um, before we had that little move, so you were talking about doing cycle cross as a way because as a way of training. So cycle cross for people that don't know, it's a lot of really high intensity effort and it's a lot of getting off the bike and running with the bike and getting back on the bike. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yep, that's a good explanation. It's kind of like a, it's like a, it's an obstacle course essentially. That's usually a mile to two miles in in distance that you ride a loop of, and there'll be there'll be technical hills that you have to hop off your bike, shoulder your bike to run up them, stairs, barriers, um, those types of things. So it is very versatile. It's a very diverse discipline, um, and and you know I'm saying that cyclocross and enduro go hand in hand. Well, I'll tell you that my most recent enduro race was in Colombia just a week and a half ago, and um, and it was insanely muddy. So there was a fair amount of running with our bicycles, and my cyclocross skills absolutely came into play. And uh, I felt like I had a huge edge on some of my competition just because I was used to running in mud with a bicycle. Right. So I'm, I'm cur- I've always been curious about this. How do you, how do you train for cyclocross? Are you doing a lot of, are you sprinting with a bike and training? Are you just doing the course? Like, do you, how do you set that up? Yes. So training for cyclocross um, also involves a lot of intervals, and I'll go out and kind of make my own courses and uh, play around with doing uh, quick accelerations out of corners, dismounts and remounts. Dismounts and remounts are where you can make up a significant amount of time um, if you can do those well. But the ultimate training for cyclocross racing is cyclocross racing. Mm. Unlike other disciplines of cycling where you can put in time outside of that competitive world to gain that edge with cyclocross, it's very unique because there's hardly anything that simulates that type of intensity with those obstacles. Mm. So the racing, oftentimes the first couple of races of the season, you feel a little bit uh, rusty and kind of blown out when you finish the race, but then all of a sudden that high intensity training kicks into your system and once you have that under your belt, that's a great platform for the rest of the season. I'd imagine just looking at it from the outside, it seems like there's a huge technical aspect as well just because getting off your bike, on your bike, like those transitions, I I would imagine would cost you time over the long run if you're not proficient at them. Absolutely. Yeah, that that technical uh, skill is is really crucial. And then in conjunction with that, you also have diverse conditions because cyclocross happens during the fall and winter when you're experiencing inclement weather, um, mud, snow, rain, 
you name it. There's never a cyclocross race that gets canceled due to weather. Right. So that keeps you on your toes also. And uh, being able to just, you know, pick up time anywhere you can on a course, cornering really fast, um, you know, picking good lines, which is obviously a huge part of enduro racing as well. Um, you know, that adds up like pennies that you, you put in your pocket over the course of a race. And by the end of the race, if you have a whole dollar, you're <laughs> going to be way ahead of everybody else. Right, so. right. So do you do any cross training for this kind of a thing at all? Um, I do. I, I go to the gym. Um, I go to the gym three times a week and I have a trainer there that, that ramps up my, my lifting um, during the course of the season, depending what I'm training for. And then I also do quite a bit of running. Um, running is just a lot of bang for your buck. It's a it, you can do, put in a short run, 15 minutes to half an hour, and throw a few intervals in there, and you get really good quality, high intensity. Um, so that's a huge part of what I do also. Hmm. And then you know just just general playing, going outside, hiking in the mountains, doing lots of fun bike rides with friends. Things that keep me mentally fresh are absolutely paramount. You know, sometimes we talk about the physical training more than the mental training, but for me, the mental training is about resting and taking care of myself, and less is more. At this at this point in my career, less is more. Yeah. So, yeah, because it, it seems like because you have two kind of different seasons, it would be hard to stay hungry because you're not peaking for one big season. Um, you're kind of like trying to stay pretty fit all year long, which seems like it would be a lot more difficult. Yes, it is. It is. And in the past, I took a hiatus from cyclocross for three years. And so I didn't have that same fitness I had to carry all the way through. This last year, I got back into it. Um, and it was it was challenging because I had put in a full season of racing and traveling with enduro. And then to kind of maintain that spark going into cyclocross season, I had to be pretty strategic about taking big breaks all throughout the season so that by the time nationals rolled around, I was still sharp and excited, you know, just excited to ride my bike. That's one of the biggest challenges. Yeah. It seems like one thing that's cool, it seems like all of the mountain athletes that we have on here, they have a different approach to life. Like a lot of their life is play. It seems like whereas a lot of other athletes, like, especially you talk to like the CrossFit crowd, like you're six hours in a gym, you know, daily, just because you're working on your weaknesses and there's so many different disciplines that take place inside of those four walls and so when they do get out to like swim it's like they're they're swimming time trials and they're it's a very repetitive thing and when I talk to you guys you're like yeah but like mostly I'm just trying to get out there and go play (laughs) yes yeah I think uh yeah that is an interesting difference and uh and uh that's something I've certainly noticed over the course of my career talking with different athletes and it, a lot of it has to do with how you're programmed and what you need and the way that you do athletics for yourself. Mm. And there's no right way to do it. You know, it's very individual. It's very different for everybody. Sure. Um, for myself, personally, I am not a, a uh, kind of stereotypical type A athlete. Um, as a professional athlete, I, I, have to, I have to play. That's the only reason why I'm still doing what I'm doing. Right. You know, I have that desire to get out and go into the mountains and go into the woods and just have a great time where I'm not thinking about what kind of mileage I'm putting in or how hard my, you know, efforts are or what my heart rate is. In fact, I lost my Garmin two years ago in a crash in an enduro race up in Whistler, and I took it as a sign that I wasn't supposed to be looking at numbers anymore. <laughs> so you just so never I got haven't a new replaced one? it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, um, so and- that's kind of been the, like, new the kind of zen frontier in my own career, and I would say that it served me really well. Overall, I probably am a better athlete, a stronger athlete, a more motivated athlete, and I win more races now that I have a more relaxed approach. Mm. So when you started out, were you a lot more regimented when you were like, let's say, maybe trying to turn pro? And then as you got into it, you kind of figured out what you needed? Yes, I was. And when I started out, I was a cross-country racer um, and a cyclocross racer, and those are more more heavily endurance-based sports, especially cross-country. Um, and to be a top performer in cross-country riding, you have to put in volume and you have to be pretty pretty on it with power or heart rate or different tools that you use for that training. I mean, I'd say you, you have to do that for enduro racing as well, but there's just a little bit of a different flavor to the downhill stage 
racing approach, which are shorter time segments versus an hour and a half to two hour cross country race where you're going out there and hammering with a mass start right. against a huge group of people. Um, and yeah, so I put in a lot of mileage and a lot of more regimented training early on. And now that is my base that I get to lean on. Right, sure. So, <coughs> excuse me. No so it seems like when you're with the enduro, so you're it's a it's a downhill race, but then you have to get back up to the next stage. Is there a certain time limit so you can't like totally like take the chair lift? You can't totally like hang out. That's right. Yeah, I mean it, it depends on what kind of enduro series you're racing. Some of the domestic series are a bit more relaxed, um, but generally speaking all of them there is a time limit for that transition or that liaison period um at the world enduro race level um enduro world series that those are tight generally and you really have to haul after you finish you don't have much time to lollygag and hang out with friends and you know just uh yeah talk about whatever you just went through usually it's like okay we'll talk about it but we got to make sure that we're getting up to the next stage um, so fitness really does come into play in, in, in enduro as well. You know, I think when enduro was fresh as a discipline, people kind of made fun of it a little bit. They're like, oh yeah, this is what all the, you know, the retired cross country racers who just want to ride downhill are doing this or the retired downhill racers when they're looking for their next frontier, you know, this is just the easy thing to pick up. But enduro racing is probably the hardest cycling discipline I've ever done mm -hmm. because you have to be so on your game with your technical ability and you're riding dangerous stuff where the consequences are pretty significant if you're not sharp and fitness plays into that you have to feel like you can go out there and put down an effort and still keep it clean um and then be able to last for five to six hours of pedaling um to get between stages depending how how long you're going yeah so what was oh. it about enduro that that drew you over to it um well, I realized that with cross-country racing, I ultimately was always just riding up to ride down. <laughs> but I, I enjoyed the descents more than the climbs. Sure. Um, and so that was a pretty pretty key indicator for me that maybe enduro <laughs> would be the magical fit. Right. But I also always loved the, the earning of my descent, which is the reason why I never was interested in converting to downhill racing mm. because then you're only racing, you know, a three minute single stage and oftentimes you're riding a chairlift to the top. And I loved the idea of having to pedal and, and have that descent just taste that much sweeter yeah. because of the effort I put in on the front end. Yeah. yeah. For all of you guys that are listening, I know you can relate because it, either you or your best friend started out in CrossFit and then switched to Olympic weightlifting because you were realized that was the only part of the workout you liked. So you're like, why am I doing all this cardio? And I can just go straight to the part I like. Exactly. Exactly. Very similar. Right. That's a good comparison. When when you were a kid, like if you could think back and think of, you know, fifteen year old Teal or ten year old Teal, were you did you think that you would be a pro mountain biker or a pro mountain athlete even? Um not necessarily, not not on the cycling side of things. I actually didn't ra start riding bikes until college, um, so mountain biking wasn't even on my radar as a kid. Um, but I was a, a competitive cross country ski racer um, all through middle school and high school. I actually went to three uh, junior Olympics for cross country ski racing, and I had some ideas about wanting to pursue that at an Olympic level. Um, but by my senior year of high school, I actually got totally burned out on cross-country skiing mm. and quit it completely and joined theater, and it was the best decision of my life. Really? <laughs> yep. That, that seems like a challenge. Like, when you see somebody that's made it to, the, like, the ultimate, the elitist level of that sport, not only did they put in the hours, but they survived the burnout, and that seems like the hardest part. Yes. It really is, and I think that's one of the things I'm always – very cautionary about when I look at kids who are up and comers in any sport, you know, if they're being pushed too hard either by themselves or by external uh, pressures like parents or coaches who are super gung ho, you know, maintaining that passion over the course of a of a career lifetime is is a challenge. Um, so I think it's important that there's some play introduced, especially in those early stages that that 
allow somebody, especially a kid, to recognize the fun of what they're doing um, to help, you know, motivate them to continue down the road. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you picked up a mountain bike. I think I read you were 20 years old when you started biking, like a racing. That's correct. Yes. And, and so what was that transition like? And then like, what was it like starting? Did you think like, oh, this is something I'm going to love and try to go pro at? Or like, what was that whole thing like? Yeah. So I joined the Fort Lewis cycling team in college my second year. Um, cause one of my good friends from high school, she was also going to Fort Lewis and she had raced mountain bikes previously when she was younger in high school. And she said, you know, I think this is something you'd really like. I think it's something you'd be really good at. Um, let's join the team together. And so on a whim, I was like, sure, why not? I'm a mountain kid. I think I could get into this. Right. Um, and then I won my first collegiate race and I was hooked. I was like, oh, well, maybe I do have, it. maybe there is something here. <laughs> you won the very first race you ever did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Sure. No and so, yeah, I mean, that was a, a, totally an addictive feeling right out of the gate. Um, but more than that, it was also just the community that surrounded mountain biking that brought me in. And, uh, you know, after three years of competing in college, I started thinking, a little more seriously about whether I want whether or not I wanted to pursue it as a pro and then I won the collegiate national championship in cyclocross my last year of college and that was a stepping stone onto a pro team I got picked up immediately after that and so then it was kind of like no looking back you know whether it had been a dream of mine or not the opportunity was on my plate right so after college you're like nine to five pro pro athlete <laughs> trying to figure out what it is yeah do. Yeah, pretty much. But I did juggle another job for the first couple years of my career because, um, believe it or not, pro cyclists don't exactly make <laughs> a ton of money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I actually I worked for a uh, worked for AmeriCorps for two years for a tobacco prevention organization doing policy work, while I was also training full time as a, a professional cyclocross racer. Interesting. So when I talked to you, when we had Sonia Looney on the show and uh, a pro endurance mountain bike racer or ultra endurance, I guess, um, she talked about this idea that she was basically like a media distribution center. Like, although she was a pro mountain biker, she basically had to have her personal brand and constantly she was like an entrepreneur as well. Do you find yourself in that role now or, or are you at the point where biking is really taking over? It's, it is the lifestyle. Yeah, well, I've kind of dabbled across the board with some, some variety in that capacity. And what I mean by that is when I got picked up by Cal Giant, which was the first pro cyclocross team I rode for, I was on a team. So I, I was folded into kind of their media platform um, for getting my start. But I was learning the ropes as to how to promote myself in that context. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then I joined uh, the Luna Pro team which is a much bigger um, mountain bike and cyclocross team. And they also had a really great promotional platform. And I learned a ton about how to craft my own brand and build it collaboratively with the brand of the team. Um, and we had a lot of big name sponsors. I mean, Luna is, is Cliff Bar. So there was a, a, a great amount of uh, uh, backing behind the team and support for all of us as athletes to do that. Um, but after I left Luna, I joined Scott, um, and I, I still ride Scott bikes and that was more of a privateer, uh, scenario. So in that context, I was tasked more with being that media house that Sonia Looney describes mm. of being able to promote myself and my own brand in conjunction with the brands that support me. Um, and I'm still in that position, but it's, it's like that is just one job of several that I currently do because even being in that position, it's still hard to earn a living and make enough money to survive doing that solely. Um, plus, it can be extremely exploitive and there can be some difficult uh, territory to navigate for having that position. Mm. So what year was it when you <coughs> what year was it when you got into mountain bike racing? I'm sorry, ask me that one more time. Uh, what year was it when you got into mountain bike racing? I got into mountain bike racing in 2007. Okay, so it was kind of after the really big like time for mountain biking, which was like in the 90s. But That's I'm, right. 
I'm wondering if, because I, I used to race when I was like 14, 15 years old, and I just remember it being so big, like, but that was like 1998 or some bullshit like that. Um, yeah. But is it, do you feel like it's trending back up or, or where do you feel like the, the growth of the sport is now? Yes, I do feel that it is trending back up slowly. It kind of went to a dark place in even just the last couple of years. Certainly the 90s were the heyday. Um, now I would say that the trend of mountain biking is anything that's relatable. So enduro racing has been growing on a global scale because it has this, this idea of um, you can go out and ride with your friends. It's very social. And even though on the stages you're racing against the clock and it's a time trial, you get to hang out with your friends again at the bottom and ride all the transitions together. Mm. So there's a relatability to that discipline. And I would say that relatability theme um, is something that crosses uh, crosses the board with mountain biking for what's making it popular. Is any any time that companies can create a product that has some kind of a fun social relatability around it, or races that involve a lot more collaboration and uh, socializing, um, that's really what's selling because that's what makes people feel like, hey, I could do that too. Yeah. Um, Whereas World Cup mountain bike racing, which is kind of where the heyday was at in the 90s, it's not relatable. I mean, it's still big in Europe because Europe has this diehard bike culture over there that's deeply ingrained. But um, in the United States, I would say that is definitely not a popular discipline for people because... I mean, what's relatable about World Cup cross-country mountain right. bike racing? Right. Don't you don't know. watch that and go, wow, that looks fun. I'd love to do that. Yeah. I, mean, who I feels really that want way? to suffer up that help. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. So also, too, I think that probably helps out with the community aspect of it. It's like if, if the spectator has done it before, like I know that's a big thing with the ultra community, the ultra um, marathon community, and that's kind of what I've been into lately is like everybody's suffered out there before and so they've done it so they have an idea of what it's like so when you come into an aid station like the community is just crazy because everybody wants to help because they know what it's like to kind of do it and so if it's got that relatability factor i think that's what makes it really cool yes absolutely absolutely yeah i mean that community that gets built that you're describing i mean that's what makes the experience so worthwhile you know you walk away from an event like that and you're like wow everybody had my back you know, even though I was suffering like a dog, we were all in it together. Right. Do you have yeah. any Do you have any habits or um, like superstitions that you stick to on race day, or any habits that you think have led to your success? Um. Let's see. Not really. Not anymore. I feel like when I was younger, I was starting out, I probably had some strange superstitions, but I can't think of any. That there's none that come to mind right now, other than just you know. I focus a lot on just being centered and protecting myself from other people's anxious energies. Mm. You know, race environments are strange because everybody is insecure and everyone's walking around feeling nervous and unsure of themselves. And so I take time to stay away from people and shield myself from their anxieties and uh, just kind of focus on getting into my own zone. Um, yeah, I guess if there was a habit that I would describe, that would be it. So that's a, that's an interesting thing because I think no matter what your sport is, it's super easy to get really revved up from people around you. Uh, and so what does that look like for you? How, how do you like actively protect your energy, I guess? Um, yeah, it's true. I mean, you, you do get revved up with other people. I mean, I, I, I would just say that, you know, I try to um, limit my conversations that I have before I drop in for a stage mm. you know a lot of people will sit around and socialize and I might do a little bit of that but then I very consciously try to create space from other people so that I can just have my own energy to deal with and kind of figure out where I'm at and get centered and grounded um yeah I mean it's challenging because you are in a social environment in most competitive environments and so you're you're around other people but um, yeah, it's also depends on your sensitivity levels. Like I know I absorb other people's energy, um, really dramatically. So for me, I, I have to make sure I get that space and that distance. Um, so in some respects, I think, you know, enduro racing, which is a time trial, 
I don't have to deal with as many people's energy because I'm not in a mass start environment any longer. Um, it's always a, a readjusting process when I get back to cyclocross, which is a mass start. Right. Yeah, I, w- I think the, the hardest part of enduro seems like this, you know, ability to go parasympathetic when you're in the transition phase and you're trying to like recover. I'm sure you're trying to get your heart rate back down and probably just like conversing with other people helps that. But then you have to like get like back to peak, like ready to go, you know, within that next like few minutes and then try to dial it all the way back down and then do it again over and over. Yeah, that seems exhausting. Yes, that's true. Yeah, it is exhausting. I mean, it's mentally and physically exhausting. Um, I think that one thing I've learned over the last four years of racing enduro almost exclusively has been that instead of freaking out in those first couple minutes dropping into a new stage and being like, I need to be going full on anaerobic as hard as I can go, I'm back in it. It's just to take a few minutes to settle in and allow myself to adjust to that ramped up intensity that I'm putting my body through again and focus on just riding clean and smooth. Mm. You know, um, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. You know, that's always going through my head. And then, you know, I ramp it up because I have the training under my belt to rely on. So I know I'll get back into that intensity, but it's not necessarily going to click immediately out of the gate. And that's okay. As long as I'm riding smooth and I'm not making mistakes, I'm going fast. Right. Sure. Yeah. Do you listen to music while you ride? I do when I'm training on the road. I don't listen to music when I'm riding mountain bikes because I like to be able to hear the sounds of my bike and make sure that everything is functioning. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so pre-show, we started talking about like how, how you came across my radar and why I wanted to have you on Lionheart Radio. So one of my buddies sent me an article and I got reading it. And basically, it was about the introduction of marijuana to sport and whether that's a good thing or not. Um, and so I definitely have my opinions and I want to express them, but I want to see cool. how, and you are one of the first, uh, sponsored, or you are the first sponsored mountain biker by a marijuana company. How has that introduction been? How have people perceived it? You know, I would say 99% of the feedback has been positive. Um, which is interesting. I'm not sure that if you had asked me prior to jumping on board with this sponsor, if I would have guessed that, but, um, what I've found is that people are really receptive to the to the conversation around cannabis products and how it comes into play in sport and how it already is in play in sport, um, especially extreme sports on the recreational side. A lot of people are already marijuana users. Um, so this kind of brings the conversation to light for them. And then on the medicinal side, and that's the side I'm most keen on and focused on for recovery purposes. Cannabis products absolutely have a place in sport. Um, they're less harmful than even taking ibuprofen repeatedly. Mm. I mean, most athletes have go-to medications for for anti-inflammation um, and using something that's a safer alternative that has uh, less consequences over time or pain recovery from injuries instead of taking opioids. I mean, cannabis has all types of, of uh, uh, has a place, I should say, yeah. um, in the sports world, all of those things. Yeah, that's been my one of my biggest arguments. So when I got into ultramarathon running about two years ago, I'm in the military, so I obviously cannot smoke weed. But one of the things that like really got to me was this fact that like I would finish these races and I would be completely wrecked. And you know, your adrenaline's been spiked so many times and you've been up for days. And you like really can't sleep and you're in a ton of pain. So your only option is to take a shitload of Advil PM and you obviously you can't eat mm-hmm. either. Um, and so like just your only option is beat the hell out of your liver and hope you can get some sleep when it's like, so you, yep. that's the better option than smoking, eating a bunch of really good food and then just sleeping for 12 hours. Like how is that I a know. better option? <laughs> I absolutely, I completely agree with you. And I mean, and there's a lot of studies out there now about, how those, you know, mild over-the-counter pain medications, how those do affect your body over time. And yeah, it's a quick fix. Easy, pop a pill, get your muscles to relax. Finally, you can get some sleep. But long-term, I mean, it's brutal. And what we do to our bodies as athletes is already pretty brutal. So if you're adding another layer of like your medication on top of that, um, breaking your body down, you know, that's really detrimental. Mm. Um, so having, having safer alternatives out there is is absolutely imperative 
But there's a reason why the safer alternatives have been so stigmatized and have been taboo for so long because certainly they're a threat to a lot of the medications that people default to. Yeah, and that seems like a common argument among the crowd that is for legalization is that they think that it's obviously taking money away from uh, a big pharma. For... Yes, I mean, it is. I mean, because the more research that's being done on cannabis, and thank goodness there's some, you know, there's, there's this legal platform in a variety of states now so that research can be conducted. And I'm not saying that we have all the answers. And I'm not saying that we know 100% all of the side effects either. But thank goodness we're able to start doing some research to figure that out now. And a lot of the research, the positive research that's coming out, is indicating that CBDs, which is one of the key cannabinoids that's been studied for medicinal purposes, um, and a variety of other cannabinoids, have extreme value on the medicinal side for not only anti-inflammation and pain medication, but for you know deeper issues like treating seizures, treating cancer, um, you know, treating ailments that are, are really significant that people have had all different types of medication that they've been using to regulate. Mm. So there's, there's a lot of value. It's kind of like this wonder plant that can fix a lot of issues that we currently have a huge variety of medication to address. Right. Do you see for that reason, do you see, because it does seem like it's going to be legalized at some point here in the next probably decade, but like federally, do you see big pharma getting involved in this? Do you, do you see them trying to just get ahead of the curve because they can't oh, beat it? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. I wouldn't be surprised if they're already pulling patents. I mean, the U.S. government already has patents for CBD for treating uh, neurological injuries. Um, which is something that people don't necessarily know, that the U.S. government is already figuring out ways of owning patents for the rights to treat specific neurological injuries with CBD. I mean, fascinating, because Damn. CBD is a Schedule One drug in conjunction with cannabis right. um, on a federal level. But yeah, I would not be surprised if Big Pharma is already pulling permits pulling patents, whatever it takes to get their hands in it. It's a big industry. It's a money-making industry, um, without a doubt. Yeah. And they probably see dollar signs. Yeah, yeah, right, I'm sure. And and once it seems like once that wave starts crashing, like they're just going to get ahead of it, it seems like. So you, you keep talking about CBD. For the listeners, for people that aren't aware of what that is, it's uh, the non-psychoactive component of marijuana. Is that true? Yes, that's correct. Yes, non-psychoactive component. So you can actually take CBD products. Um, there are some CBD products now that are available even at natural food stores because they don't have the psychoactive THC mm -hmm. cannabinoid. Um, and in their pure form, they're still very potent and um, uh, uh, valuable for, for, treat, for treating different ailments. But I will tell you that, generally speaking, CBD paired with THC, even if it's in a very, very small percentage, like 0.03%, you can find products, tinctures, with that low of a percentage, is more effective because THC is fat-soluble. So it allows for CBDs to actually um, uh, penetrate your cells and, uh, and be utilized by the body better. Mm. And what about to the degree that it hurts performance? Or are you not smoking it? Or, or what does that look like? Because you're still a cardio-based athlete. Totally. Yeah, my preference is not to smoke weed. Um, yeah, and taking it in, inhaling it um, definitely uh, affects my lungs for sure. So that's not my preference. I will on occasion. Mm -hmm. But for me, I prefer edibles um, as my number one go-to. Um, bombs, I use a lot of topical cannabis products um, and uh, and then the tinctures um, you can get oil tinctures that you put under your tongue um, that are really effective so there, there's a lot of options now for products that exist out there I mean you can get you can get pills you can get lozenges you can get it in a drinkable form mm. um, yeah there's there's a lot of options and, and a lot of it is about figuring out what products work well for you and what your body responds well to I mean I even have a cannabis bath salts that I use when I take Epsom salt baths and mm. that is the best product ever. Wow. I just love that. After I do a really big race or a really big training day, um, you know, I'll take an Epsom salt bath with the cannabis salts and it's like, it just rejuvenates my entire body. I wake up the next day feeling like 
you know, I'm fresh as a daisy. Like right. I never did anything. <laughs> <laughs> you better, you better keep that away from Florida. They heard bath salts and weed. They're <laughs> coming in hot. <laughs> Seriously. So when you, what, what are the topical uses or, or is that the topical uses that you're talking about? Um, so some of the topical creams that I use are balms that are cannabis mixed with Arnica. So if you're used to using Arnica oil or Arnica salves, it's very similar but the cannabis in the cannabis in there has a similar effect, kind of amplifies that effect. Um, anti-inflammation, dealing with sore muscles, bruises, um, you know, uh, shallow injuries, um, just helps uh, regeneration of that area mm. um, quicker. Okay. Yeah. So, so what about the fact that um, the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, USADA, WADA, all these things that kind of regulate sport, um, certainly the the bigger sports have marijuana as being um, you're, you're unable to smoke it if you compete in any sports that are regulated by them. Um, yes. are, are, is your sport not? And like, what, what does that look like? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I'm hoping at some point to be able to have some dialogues with those uh, regulatory bodies, because I think these conversations need to be had. It's like this, this is here now. So, we can just bury our head in the sand and pretend it's not, or we can actually have some constructive conversations. That's kind of my goal, is to go in that direction. But in the short term, um, cyclocross is regulated by UCI, which is the International Cycling Governing Body. Um, and so for cyclocross season, I won't use any cannabis products that have THC in them um, that would put me on that radar. CBD was actually just approved as of 2018 mm -hmm. by uh, by USADA or by WADA, um, and so now that's no longer on the banned substance list. So using pure CBD products don't put athletes at risk with those uh, regulations. But anything with THC, there's still a minimum amount of THC that you're allowed to have in your system if you go through any drug testing. Oh, so gotcha. I just steer clear of it for cyclocross. For enduro racing, enduro is not governed by any of those bodies. Um, the Enduro World Series has a couple races that this year, for the first time, I believe, are now UCI. So for those races, there probably will be testing and there will be some concern around that. But generally speaking, enduro is more of a rogue sport. It's kind of the the rebel mountain bike discipline. Yeah. So it doesn't have the same, uh, yeah, the same regulations that apply. Mm. So for people that are interested in in possibly like experimenting with and using marijuana as a pseudo ergogenic aid, but also as to just uh, aid in recovery, like what is the process or what, what do you recommend for people to even begin using something like this? Um, I would highly recommend talking to somebody who's educated about it. Um, if you're in a state where there's dispensaries, most dispensaries have a lot of professionals that work there. Um, that's been my experience living in Nevada and I'm from Colorado originally and actually left Colorado right after the legalization went through. So I don't know a ton about the Colorado dispensaries, but I would say on average, most dispensaries have, have people there who are extremely knowledgeable about all of the different products that they're selling mm -hmm. and walking in and saying, I'm an athlete and I've learned the value of CBDs and I want to experiment with some products. What do you recommend for me? Mm. Um, because there's all different types of strains of cannabis and some strains are higher in THC. Some are higher in CBDs. There's certain strains that are almost pure CBD with a very minimal amount of THC. Like they won't necessarily give you a psychoactive effect at all, but they're extremely valuable for recovery. So just asking about that, what kind of strains do you have? What's high in CBD? What do you recommend um, as an athlete? Um, because they're used to offering products to people that are coming in for all different purposes. Mm. So I think that would be the best starting point. Yeah, that yeah. that strain are that strain conversation is it's really interesting how advanced potheads have gotten in the last few yeah. years. Because like, oh my gosh, yeah. it is unbelievable. I have learned so much about the weed industry since I've picked up this sponsorship. I bet, and I just can't believe the minds that are behind some of these 
uh, these strains and grows and the products that are being produced. <laughs> right. It's absolutely insane. Yeah. yeah. La last time I was in San Diego, I, I saw this app and like basically you just picked what you wanted to be on the app. Like, oh, you want to be happy? You want to be tired? You want to be yeah. <laughs> like yeah. <laughs> crazy? Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, there's strains out there that are appetite suppressants right. instead of appetite inducing which I never would have thought that when I think about weed, that is the, the exact opposite that I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, strains that are really great for sleeping, strains that are really great for getting things done. Um, there's a strain that, um, that, uh, that Kind produces, my sponsor, called MTF, and they call it the workhorse strain. When, when you smoke that or ingest it, it makes you crazy motivated and you'll go and like reorganize your entire closet and clean your house from top to bottom and probably go for a run and maybe get a ride in and yeah i mean it's it's crazy and and i mean it's wild they they definitely kind of promote that as their workhorse strain mm. um but speaking on that subject i don't train using cannabis and i don't race using cannabis that for me is a personal preference i use them for those products for recovery or in my downtime, separate from from my uh, my riding and training, because for me it makes me not. I don't feel as sharp. I don't feel as focused. Um, but it's a personal preference thing. I have lots of friends who are recreational users, and they'll use it when they ride, and they, it makes them. They love it. Mm. it. It makes them super stoked on whatever they're doing. So. Yeah, I've always been interested in that people that can smoke and then work out. I'm like, you're a freak. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. That's how I feel, too. Right. That's how I feel, too. Yeah. So yeah. is that, in your opinion, for an athlete, is that probably the biggest, the most beneficial area to begin using it is, is in your recovery? Yes, I would say so. But also, you know, to be totally honest, I think that it has some great psychological benefits, too, going back to our earlier conversation about physical training versus mental training. Well, right. the same thing goes with physical recovery versus mental recovery. I mean, there's a lot of pressure and anxiety that's involved in being a competitive athlete. You know, there's a whole bunch of crazy psychology that we have to deal with. Usually, you know, we're in our own way. We can be our own worst enemy. Sure. So being able to have a, a product that helps us to kind of let go and relax and think about the world in a different way, see it through a different lens, I think is hugely valuable and I think it's something that can sometimes be undervalued for athletes because it's not focused on enough you know how do you find your center how do you live a balanced life you know how do you get out and play or make time for family in conjunction with all the crazy stuff that you're doing how do you get out of your own head so that you can let go and be in a different mind space um, so I would say that you know cannabis certainly has value in that in that realm as well yeah, yeah, I would completely agree with you. Uh, all right, cool. So the Lionheart Kicker is a final question, and we ask every guest, and it's based on advice. So if you could give blanket advice, and it were guaranteed everybody in the world would hear it, and it would be translated to every language, and it can be on life, athletics, weed, whatever you want. You could have a platform for a minute, and you could tell somebody or tell everybody something. Uh, what would you tell people? I would tell people that... Um, Sometimes we think that other people in the world have things figured out better than we do. And the truth is, the big secret is that <laughs> nobody knows what they're doing. Everybody's and faking it. <laughs> everybody's faking it. And if you recognize that, it gives you this huge amount of personal power because all of a sudden you realize that it's an equal playing field. Hmm. And you can go out in the world and take on any challenge, any new opportunity, whether it's in life, athletics, whatever it is, and just know that you have the chance to be just as much of an expert as anybody else. Yeah. So don't get intimidated by other people who act like they know what they're doing because they don't. We're right. all just shooting from the hip, feeling our way in the dark. Right. No, I love that, especially now because, you know, social media has taken that problem and put it on steroids right because now yes. everybody looks like they have it all put together and every relationship is perfect and everybody has good skin and you're like, oh what totally the fuck? <laughs> yeah. totally yeah and i mean it's it's really horrible because it totally it totally uh plays on our insecurities and on our you know our human our human lust after comparison you yeah. know we're always needing to compare ourselves and feel like 
we have a leg up on somebody. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, is that we all have a leg up on each other if we recognize that, if we recognize that we have the ability to to do anything, to be anything, and that nobody out there really knows any better than we do. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Is that, <laughs> a, is that a mantra that you've always lived by? You know, I think I have, but I don't think I had as much clarity around it until probably just the last uh, three to four years. You know, I've taken on some big professional challenges in my professional life, uh, separate from cycling, and then also in my cycling world. And I've, you know, jumped into things that were brand new and, you know, built things from the ground up and been very successful mm. and realized that, oh, wow, I just, you know, kind of Holy jumped shit. in, took the risk, and I figured it out. And yeah. I don't know that I'm necessarily smarter or stronger than anyone else, but it was the risk taking part that allowed those doors to open and just gave me that insight of, hey, I can do this too. We right. all can. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I think it's cool that you, you're the first person, I think, out of so your 99th guest, and you're the first person to ever, like, really vocalize it, but that's, like, one thing I've noticed in this show. Like, I've gotten to in interview all these pro athletes and entrepreneurs and thought leaders, and the one thing, that, the theme, I would say, if you could pull a thread through all of them, is that they literally just had an idea, and then they just did it. They, like, nobody yes. gave them permission. Nobody was like, oh, you are perfect to do this. It was like, no, I think I could do that, and then they went and did it, and they just have that mindset. So thank yes. you for vocalizing that for people. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. I think that is um, something that athletes often share in common as an innate component of who we are, but just you know, a reminder to everybody that you can take that and apply that to life. Yeah, you know that that concept is it's it's so powerful. It's so powerful. When you apply that, you're totally unstoppable. Yeah, I agree, and, th and that's cool because it's athletes that are constantly teaching us what humans are capable. They're constantly redefining what we think is like. Oh shit, humans are possible. Humans are capable of doing that. Like that's possible. And yes, so it's like perfect. Yes, that's right. That's right. So awesome. for people that are listening to this and they want to follow along with your journey and support what you're doing, where's the best place for them to do that? Um, so I have a few different social media sites that are my, just my full name. So my name is Teal Stetson Lee. That's T-E-A-L-S-T-E-T-S-O-N-L-E-E. -E -E. You can find me under that name on Instagram or Facebook. Um, or tealstetsonlee.com is my website. Um, which hopefully I'll update in the next couple of weeks and you'll have something fresh to check out. <laughs> all right, perfect. And we'll link all of those up in the show notes. So you guys can check that out, lionheartrad.io, and then we will have all of her stuff linked up. Teal, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate you taking the time. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Great conversation. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. I hope that the information from today's show will make you fitter, happier, and healthier. For the show notes of this episode and every episode, head to www.lionheartrad.io. Yep, just like Lionheart Radio. And please, if you have the time, head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us to know that we're on the right track in delivering you reliable information and value. As always, feedback is welcome. If you have any comments on the show or like to suggest a guest, send me an email at rick at louaviv.com. That's L-U-A-V-I-V-E. Dot com. Thanks for your support, yeah. and we will see you next time. <laughs> Bitch, I feel good. Don't I look stupendous? My shine is so endless, and shit you can do to end this. Even when I'm dead, niggas still gon' bump that chip shit. Coke, white, escalate on cinches for you dipshit. So you won't forget this. Me and West, nigga, be the coldest. Cleveland,